Thank you so much, Bellick, and uh, just thrilled to be here for the opening of our Applied Social Media Lab, uh, the central constituents of which I think are sprinkled throughout the room. If you uh, identify as an ASMLer, uh, can you just raise your hand? So uh, there are so many projects among this group. Uh, if you are not an ASMLer, you might want to talk to one of them at one of the breaks uh, or otherwise to hear a little bit more about some of the things cooking at the lab. Um, so welcome, friends. Welcome, friends. Let's make some content together, shall we? Let's see what kind of engagement we can get. And uh, Dana, I'd love to start with you. Dana has been thinking deeply about and uh, listening carefully to uh, many of her ethnographic subjects about uh, the topics uh, covered on this panel. And I think we might have been A-B testing the different titles. One of them uh, had to do with an age of fracture. And I guess if we're in an age of fracture, it's probably uh, now uh, licensed to drink. It's, it's, it's that old. Um, and one of the signal concepts you introduced early in the age of fracture was that of context collapse. That something that happens within one space suddenly gets transported to another, and what is uh, a dispute within a community can become a national issue for uh, a cable news show, uh, in quotation marks, to dissect, and that that makes it hard to have the initial conversation within the community, if I'm getting that concept right. So far, so good? So far. There were also, I would just remember over the years, at least two cool nuggets I think I learned from you, one of which was within the US military back in the day, the enlisted used MySpace and the officers used Facebook, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting, those sorts of ways in which class and structure and hierarchy uh, all uh, relate to one another. And uh, I also learned from you, and maybe uh, it was long enough ago that the kids that you were speaking about are now like here in the room and drinking. Um, older. They're older, yeah. But it was that uh, people routinely, kids routinely will deactivate things like their Facebook accounts for just an afternoon or something. It's like office hours. You hang out the shingle to activate your account to say, I'm here for the next little while, and then just turn it off as if you were leaving the service overnight so it doesn't gather dust or something. So just really interesting ways of exploring the space. Um, here's a softball question. What are you thinking about lately? There Working. we go. Um, I think it's important to remember why people were originally going to a lot of these services, these online environments. They were looking for connection. They were looking for community, right? And if you think about the earliest uses of online fora, including you know social network sites, it was self-identified geeks, freaks, and queers, um, for which I identify as all three, um, <laughs> that were very, very happily finding their, their people in these online environments. And they were investing in those relationships. And so what we saw when young people started to embrace it, because young people are a very notable um, early adopter population, is that as they were starting to embrace these early phases of social media, there were two sort of segments of them. There were those who were following in line with the traditional folks of like, I don't have my peeps in the, in the community, so I'm going to go and find and invest them online. And there were those who were very much being like, I'm going to take my, or my offline world, my school world, into the online, right? And over time, this goes back to our context collapse, right? Like over time, all of these things started to mush together and people were having to navigate multiple worlds and being like, whoa. You know, and when I was doing all of this work, of course, we're back. We're back in another phase of like fear mongering around kids that a lot of people were like, oh my gosh, kids are going online. They're addicted to online. Then why are they not offline? I'm like, they're not offline because you won't let them. Right, And so a lot of it was about parents restricting access. And I was looking at it in terms of the restrictions to public space. But I'm coming back to a lot of this old work for a reason. Because there was one thing I really didn't understand when I did that first phase of work, which was how important non-custodial adults are for young people. So what is a non-custodial adult? These are your mentors and your coaches and your pastors and your aunties, like all of the different people who do not hold immediate power over you, but are really important in your life and are part of your peripheral world. And these are the people who look out and be like, you don't look like you're doing so good. Like, how you doing? 
right? Those people are so critical, but they're also critical when you're having a mental health breakdown. Because when you're having a mental health breakdown, you're like, I need somebody to talk to and I'm pretty much guaranteeing it's not my parents, right? And so the thing is, is that that was also disintegrating at the time. And these were not the people people were building these online relationships with, with few exceptions. And I want to caveat the different kinds of online gaming that actually were very interesting exceptions to this. But this has become much more acute. And so this social, this comes back to the social fracture concern because what's happened, COVID really ended up being a breaching experiment in all sorts of unexpected ways where young people had no access to non-custodial adults. They were with their parents all the time for a while, right? And then they came back out and, you know, they were maintaining those peer relationships through social media, but they were not building and maintaining those other non-custodial adult relationships. They came out of COVID and then they went like, oh, where is everybody? Like who, you know, there's no connection. There's no visibility. The adults are stressed out. They're maxed out. And the reason I say this is I'm on, I was a founding board member of a mental health organization. And when we do, um, you know, de-escalation in a suicide effort, one of the first things we look for is who can you turn to that is a non-custodial adult that you can reach out to? And we saw basically through COVID and to this day, no one. And that's terrifying. So I set this up for you because I think it's really important to think about what are the roles of these technologies? Where do they you know, supplement and complement the dynamics? Where can they do the repair work? And where do we need to repair in ways that have nothing to do with the technology in order to make the technology vibrant itself? Uh-huh. Um, that's another great title for the panel, if uh, maybe a little long. Uh, and I want to just ask two quick follow-up questions, which probably, to do them justice, would have very long answers. But just to kind of set the set the tone a little further. Bellick's introduction talked a lot about the actions of a platform like Facebook or Twitter in, in creating the environment and presenting unasked what uh, a user, a kid might want to contemplate or think about and the promote and police thing. You know, kind of a flavor of what somebody said at some point, code is law. I don't know who that was. Oh, there he is. Hi, Larry. Um, but uh, is there any immediate thing you could think that would be within the platform's purview to do to be helpful here? Or is your message, this is a society problem, it's not really a just tweak Facebook problem? So I think it's important to realize that any social context has, you know, dynamics to it that you you can do interventions on. I want to be very clear. Never use the word solution. It's a misunderstood term for thinking about these issues from computer science. These are interventions. Interventions have intended and unintended outcomes. And it's really important to understand those ripples. And I say this because I think I, of an intervention as everybody gets around Elon Musk and is like, we need to talk. That's yeah, that's definitely a needed one. A very important yeah. one. But I say this because I think that it's, you know, critical to think about, you know, do we need interventions across all these? Of course. But let's also start with like, we need interventions at school. School continues to be the primary site of bullying, no matter how many times we go back and think it's happening online. Are there interventions that should happen around technology? Yes. But frankly, I would start upstream, not downstream. I'd like to address what it means to be dealing with late stage financialized capitalism and the way that that incentive means that this is just gonna keep getting worse. Because how does Meta make more money? It has to find more users. Uh, it has to diversify it, yeah. P and L, or it has to get creepier and creepier. Yeah, which poses a dilemma of at some point to fix anything requires fixing everything, at which point you're like, you know what, I'm just gonna turn on Matlock, no, but, say, no, yeah. No, I would say, like, you know, we're having a lot of conversations about how to regulate tech. Yeah. Regulate the taxing of tech. Uh-huh. Okay, that was a big mic drop thing, but I'm gonna keep going. Yeah, go One last question before we uh, move on. Uh, I've been thinking a little bit about what I call the um, three laws of digital governance, for which maybe there's a fourth, and I, I style the three laws of digital governance as, one, we don't know what we want, two, we don't trust anybody to give it to us, and three, we want it now. And uh, the optional fourth is, an AI can scale it. And so, um, on the fourth law, uh, 
I remember the day of Crisis Text Line. You may remember that service, which actually the was- one that I'm on the board of? Uh, yeah. Funny that. Yeah. So uh, there uh, were humans that could be paired with other humans to kind of chat and be that non-custodial responsible adult. Um, all right, the very first widely known chatbot, Eliza from the 1960s, I think 68 or thereabouts, was styled as a therapist. Would you be open to somebody like Gordon running an experiment with an AI LLM that's like, bring me your kids and I'll talk some wisdom into them? So I have no problem with AI chatbots when they're honest that they're AI chatbots. Like, have a field day. And there's a lot of people who find really good benefit from them that they're like, oh, I want to brainstorm with something that's outside of my head because I'm going like this. No problem. But that serves a very different purpose than what Crisis Text Line serves. Mm -hmm. The power of Crisis Text Line, and we have been committed since the beginning of augmentation, not automation. Because at the end of the day, and there's a lot of AI tools, by the way, in the augmentation of the system. But at the end of the day, what you end up with is when somebody's in crisis, what they're grateful is that a human has spent time listening to them. And that is meaningful. That is so powerful when you're in a crisis. It's just like somebody, even a stranger, is willing to dedicate time. And that will never be replaced because these are the kinds of gifts. It's like thinking about an economy when you only think about it as financial exchange. So much of the exchange, me volunteering to show up for you today, is about, Thank you. Yes. <laughs> it's about building a relationship, right? You know, there's an there's a amount of debt that you and I keep going back and forth, that ways we gift to each other, and ways that we offer time and attention that build relationships. That cannot be replaced. That cannot be made more efficient. That is what builds a social fabric. The mm. social, and the reason for all of you who are fellows here, for all of you who are new students here, you may have come to learn from this one. You may have come for all sorts of reasons. But the power of being here is those relationships, those social fabrics that you're building. It's not the courses you take. They're valuable. But the real valuable is the relationships. And we have to keep remembering that because that doesn't get automated. That doesn't get made efficient. That gets creepy, right? We all know the creepy networkers. This is about really dedicating ourselves to acknowledging each other as human. Yes. I'm trying to remember if I've asked you to join my professional network on LinkedIn or not. And <laughs> if I did, I'm really sorry. I, you know, yeah. Anyway, thank you, Dana. Gordon, over to you. Uh, Gordon, I think of you as somebody who just has such brilliance at taking questions that we typically ask ourselves as binaries, like, does fact checking help? And you turn them into real inquiries, like under what circumstances does fact checking help? And for what audiences and when and what might a neat, in Dana's word, intervention, not solution, uh, be of that sort of thing. And I think also your career is marked by understanding that people are as much reflexive and visceral about what they do as they are analytic. I do a panel roughly once a year here with uh, colleagues called uh, Why I Changed My Mind, and we just visit with each of them, something they really believed, wrote about, beat the drum on, and now have almost a totally different view about and how they came to that. And one thing so far that consistently has been of interest to me is that almost never do these scholars say, I read a paper and it changed my mind, <laughs> which kind of calls into question the whole enterprise. <laughs> but um, in, it wasn't I encountered content. It was I had a kid. Or uh, what's the famous thing a conservative is a liberal who's been mugged, you know, not by a paper. And uh, that's kind of the place in which you dwell. And I know you have um, a paper that just came out, was it today or yesterday, in science, on the cover. Uh, tell us about that paper and about what you're thinking about. Uh, great. Actually, it came out uh, 10 minutes ago. <laughs> science has these embargo rules, so I have, it was, that's, anyway, so it's, if you go on Twitter, don't do it while I'm talking, obviously. Uh, it'll be out there. It's already got a very long comment thread. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. we'll see what happens. Um, so before I talk about that, 
I first wanted to mention, so you talked about the brilliance thing, which uh, is not what it really is. Um, to explain how we think about this, basically the idea is pretty simple. Um, I'm a psychologist, and I want to know if we want to improve something, make people's beliefs more accurate or whatever. I need to understand what mistakes they're making in the first place. Uh, and that always brings nuance because our psychologies are complicated. Uh, often we look at solutions in a kind of more simplistic way. Once you start looking back at like what's actually happening at the individual level, you know, one size never fits all, essentially. Um, the fact-checking thing was essentially like sometimes if you fact-check, people think that the things that are not fact-checked are true. Uh, but that only happens under certain circumstances. It depends on how frequently they're seeing fact-checks. But these are these are things that you would never kind of guess unless you're like looking deep down at the actual errors that people are making. What would an example be? Uh, of, well, I mean, one, one thing that relates to this is um, uh, large-scale uh, labeling of things being created by AI. So in a context in which a lot of stuff is being created by AI, if you see a lot of those labels, the people who are deceiving, I mean, assuming that this is a sort of label that you put on yourself, the people that are creating AI things and they are trying to deceive people are going to benefit from the fact that they are being not transparent and people who are being transparent are going to have labels and people might be more skeptical about that stuff. If AIs are outlawed, only outlaws will have AIs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Didn't realize to... you'd have a strong Second Amendment view here. <laughs> yeah, I don't I guess so. Yeah. I'm Canadian, so I don't talk about the amendments. But, uh, <laughs> so anyway, so okay. So that, it's a, but this, this goes to the, the, uh, the paper that was mentioned. So this... What we, what's coming out today in science is this experiment, a set of experiments where we had AI talk to conspiracy believers about their beliefs. Uh, and with the, we told them explicitly, that is the AI, to... And how did you identify your audience? Were you like, believe in a conspiracy? Well, Come we, to this room and we'll give you money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not why. It's, it's, I mean, we run their typical online studies, meaning we're paying people to do a study. They don't know it's about AI and all that kind of stuff. And then we asked them... Are is the any, earth flat? Yeah. Like, oh, no, no, we don't. Th it's their own conspiracy. That is, the, this is the thing that makes it powerful. People are talking, because we've integrated the AI with the kind of survey software, Qualtrics, if you do that kind of thing. Uh, all that stuff, by the way, if you do uh, that kind of research, all available, you could use it yourself or use it for other purposes. And powerful. by the way, is the uh, instrument used for your specific experiment available online for us to play with? Yes, it is. I think it's debunkbot.com or something. You can, it's... We should double check it before they type. Double check it. Don't, yeah, I mean, okay. whatever. You can. It's if you look at any of the press releases and stuff like that, you'll find it. Okay. It's up. It's out there. So you go to the bot. You go to the bot. Okay. So what what happens in the experiments is you have a participant. They come. Participants come to the study from an online survey platform, and then we ask them, "Are there any kind of conspiracies that they believe in?" Uh, in subsequent studies, we ask them. We don't like say conspiracies. We say, you know, people sometimes there are secret plots that have nefarious. Sometimes people call these conspiracies. We don't want to like shy people away. But we say, just tell us something that you believe in, if you do, and give us the reasons why you believe in it. I love it. It's just a click away from the Peter Thiel classic question of like, what belief do you hold? Yeah, it would exactly. be shocking to so many of your fellow <laughs> drones. Exactly. Yeah. And, the, and so some people, not like half the people believe in some sort of conspiracy. Like, so you, some people don't end up in the experiment. Only the people that have a conspiracy are in the experiment. And then what we do is we give that information about the reasons of what they believe to the AI the AI then forms a counter uh, argument, specific evidence that says this is why these and things And did you give the AI like a system prompt? What did you tell the AI its mission was? To persuade them not to believe it. So you're about to talk to a human and... This is what they believe. Here are the reasons. Convince them not that it doesn't make sense. And then what happens is they go back and forth three times in this case. Uh, and the person reads what they say, they respond. The AI sees what they say, they respond back to that. And it's a very detailed, highly evidence-based conversation. And then for the user in the experiment, it's like, and seen. And then the experimenter bot or whatever says, now, do you still believe what you just said? Yeah, I mean, the way we do it is we ask them uh, to get in the weeds a little bit. The AI summarizes what they are saying about the conspiracy. They rate how much they believe that summary. Because what's like in their own words, I mean, in the summary of their own words, so I think at 9-11 is an inside job, et cetera. And then at the end, we ask them the same question again. So we have a pre-post measure. There's a control group that doesn't talk about conspiracies. 
Uh, and what you find is about after about eight minutes, on average, eight and a half minutes of conversation with the AI, very evidence-based, you see a massive decrease in people's certainty about the conspiracy. That's now it. that sounds like, yeah. and I don't know if you're saying like, hey, I'm just a social scientist, it's not up to me to say the implications, but it sounds like one implication is there might be some cavalry that can come to the aid of people who are out there. Um, so take heart. Yeah. Or is it, I don't know, since you let people self-identify with what their conspiratorial belief is, if my conspiratorial belief is that the earth is round and I offer that up, does that mean the AI's job is to convince me otherwise? Well, it does. So it, um... There were cases in the study where people talked about true conspiracies, like MK Ultra is a conspiracy that happened. It doesn't change people's beliefs in those cases. It's not. Successful. It knows not to. No, no, it tries to. It just. Does it does. Not. It doesn't yeah. change the belief. Yeah, it doesn't. It changes. And in, in, in the fact, that, I mean, generally speaking, the effect is larger for beliefs that are the most kind of implausible because the AI has better counter evidence to make arguments. And so, like, the, but the overall effect is about a twenty percent decrease. In people's certainty, uh, one way, another way to think about that is a quarter of the believers didn't believe the conspiracy after the conversation, uh, and this is about an eight and a half minute conversation, like I said. And th the effect is evident even for people who believe the conspiracy at the maximal level of confidence, so they're one hundred percent certain. Uh, even for people who say they're, that's extremely important for their worldviews, and uh, and the effect does not decay for two months, at least two months. We, that's when we check. That is to say, they wherever they were at the, at the end of the conversation is where they were two months later. So it actually did change people's minds. Got and, it. Yeah, and the, I mean, that is, the, the implication of this is, it's not just about conspiracies. This is about, does evidence matter? Does, can you, if you give people good counter evidence that is actually specific to what they believe, will they listen to that? Or are they motivated yes. by their identities? Do they, do they actually not care about the truth? Uh, and that's not what we find. Even for these, like, this group of people, who everyone thinks are down the rabbit hole and you can never change their mind, you see effects, evidence matters. It's also fascinating that this is like, so a psychologist walks into a room and then says, somebody ought to check this out and designs an experiment for which we just went into the weeds a little bit to demonstrate the innumerable choices you have to make if you're designing an experiment about like how to structure it and all that and no doubt, how long did IRB clearance take? Uh, well, it was at MIT. So um, that means it didn't take long. Ask, don't ask me because I was the one who got it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it was. I, I don't know, but it was not. It was. I mean, this case. IRB. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you but, were on the IRB, Dad. Yeah. I said, we do have IRB. There is not. So you do MIT have an IRB. has an it's IRB. Kind of it was clear. IRB is an institutional review board, which is the biggest difference between Facebook just doing any old shit and academics. Yeah, is yeah. the academics spend six months being like, should we? Eh. <laughs> Facebook is like Tuesday. You know. <laughs> so yeah. But by the way, and. I mean, uh, in this case, we have a very strong argument because it's benefiting people. And, and part, in fact, mm -hmm. after the conversation, people trusted the AI, AI more. Most people have really enjoyed the conversation, actually, and they, they learned a lot from it. So uh, it's, a, it's a great thing. To I, it's going to be fascinating to see the reactions because some of them might be like, it's a latter-day MK Ultra," yeah. <laughs> because it is about the use of bots at scale, rule four of the um, laws of digital governance, to be able to meet people one at a time where they're at and change their minds, it sounds like through argumentation yeah. rather than through a visceral something or other. Yes, exactly. And people know they're talking to an AI. It's explicit. Yeah. Uh, and what we've, yeah. we've done follow-up experiments where we do other things. Because one thing that the AI is really good at is building reports, very nice and pleasant and all that kind of stuff. We tell it not to do that. It doesn't change the effect. The only thing that changes the effect that we've checked so far is just telling it, don't give any reasons. And then it just implores them not to believe it because it's bad for them or bad for society or whatever. It doesn't work if you do that. It just matters that it's giving them evidence. Dana has a burning thought. What about the existence of God or any faith-based views? It's not good we at making those arguments. told you this would be a capacious panel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not very good at making those arguments. Uh, uh, so we, are, we have done some in preliminary studies on this, but nothing that... I and every time, how many, how many, what was your N? How many people? Uh, well, the whole thing was over 2,000 people. I don't know, I can't remember. And were there any instances that. where you were saying to the AI, like, you're a little bit out over your skis here? Well, we weren't monitoring it. What we did is we did fact check it. Like that is, because one concern is that it's, it was hallucinating facts and so on. 
Uh, I love so who will fact check the fact checker. Yeah, yeah. Homer Simpson's answer: Coast Guard. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, yeah. So we got. Anyways, we got. We randomly sampled some of the things, some of the assertions that the uh, AI was making across all these conversations, and it was ninety nine percent accurate in the ones that we checked. It was about two hundred or one hundred and ninety. Got it. One hundred twenty eight in total. Yeah. So uh, anyway, one one lesson so, maybe to draw is: psychologist walks into a room, walks into a lab with his team, does something like that. It has natural connection points, APIs, downstream neurons that could fire societally about what to do with what you've discovered. And what a cool idea just about, you know, we should just talk to people and see where we can take them and measure it. Like, it's both brilliant and I think maybe an illustration of how much low-hanging fruit there is right now to be testing stuff out. So for the students among us looking for like, Something to do is their independent studies, CS or Psych 495B. There's some, this is cool tools to play with. Yeah, and like I said, it's, it's available online. But if you have ideas, you can just email us. Tom Costello is the lead on it. Dave Rand is the other author. Uh, and and it will be clearly labeled them. whether a human or a bot answers. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> All right, so Deb, over to you and kind of a perfect segue to you because you're both deeply into theory and experimentation and publishing of results and also into real world product design, delivery, impact. Your history includes, I guess, an analytic startup that got bought by Twitter. Is that right? And that made you the chief media scientist at Twitter from what, 2013 to 17, something like that? 2013 to 2018, you got out of Dodge at the right time. And um, you're then somebody who fuses the world of theory and study and action. So I'm just curious, among the many, many things you have on the fire right now, what is causing you the most sort of either curiosity, stress, uh, the the one the thing for which the results are still out and you're so curious what's going to come back. Well, I think I think um, the work we just started. Can people hear him? Okay. Is this on? We need to swap mics. No, it is. It's good now. You can hear me. Okay, great. All right. Um, I th so, yeah, I think in many ways, lessons learned from, can, can you hear me? It is on now in the, in the back? How's this? All right. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, from the experiences of uh, working at Twitter, studying Twitter um, as a prime example of social media that has some, uh, some down, downsides to it, um, we... Uh, started, um, I guess in 2016, 2017, thinking about a, um, taking lessons learned of the power of social media and creating an alternative. And fast forward to today, and we have this concept of creating, rather than social media networks, and I was actually just thinking about the name of your applied social media lab, and if you kind of excavate to the origins of the term social media, um, you know, I still remember when we called Facebook and Twitter social networks. And then, you know, when these two companies um, looked for a good business model, right, to actually pay the bills, they took the media business model, and actually more than the business model, actually the media model of the whole, what's the goal of media? It's to have the ability to build an audience, reach an audience. and um, shoved it into a social network and you got a social media network and the business model worked and a lot of the incentives and even the product design, everything then kind of followed logically that surely no matter what the differences are, um, the point of this must be to build an audience and to have basically a, 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 a modern day version of broadcast reach. And um, it's not clear that that's the primary kind of social network we were seeking uh, when you talk about connection and community, um, giving everyone the ability to pick up a bullhorn and a few learn how to use it. 
Um, maybe that's useful sometimes for building connection and community, but it's sure not the only modes of, of uh, connection. So um, that led us to this concept of a different kind of social network where we take the concept of dialogue rather than media and say, how about if we put that into a social network and make a different kind of sandwich with uh, a different thing in the middle, which is dialogue. So that's uh, a concept that we have been envisioning and experimenting with. And to get to your question, what gives me, uh, I don't know, partly stress, but also excitement is um, we have in various partial forms uh, brought some of those, that idea through tools and methods to communities around the country. And in an unexpected twist where we were doing research at MIT and then we built a nonprofit to translate research into practice, so tools and methods, um, our uh, administration at MIT said, hey, we actually could use some new thinking about how to have bring dialogue and listening, uh, perhaps with some scalability beyond how we know how to do it today to our own community of 25,000 students, staff, and faculty. And so we just had orientation week at MIT um, two weeks ago where we welcomed a couple of thousand new students on campus. And we use that occasion to bring a kind of uh, minimal but complete social network that has dialogue sort of at its center and uh, introduced it to our students. And now we are introducing it to staff and faculty and um, where that's going to go, how it's going to actually take uh, root, if, if at all, um, makes me um, excited and stressed. So that's, and that's the I, answer. Just as a quick sort of question so people can understand what you've built, you're an MIT student. You've been blandished, instructed, directed to use the app. What happens next? This is something you download to your phone. It's a blinking cursor you see on your screen. It's a telnet window. What, what is it? Yeah. So first of all, um, although we are in various ways trying to encourage people to try it out, voluntary is kind of a, a key part of it. It always uh, starts voluntary, <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the key idea is uh, to, to marry two ideas. One is small group live conversation uh, that can happen. In fact, what happened during orientation week was it was live in person, so IRL conversation. Um, it can happen over Zoom or through the app that we built. doesn't matter. The key is small groups with a uh, facilitator and a structured conversation guide that has some of the intent of what that conversation is meant to uh, surface built into both the guide and some of the um, methods of the facilitator. So that's part one, small group. And the idea there is if you, you know, you talked about healthy discourse, that there is a bet that the um, canonical form in which you can elicit healthy dialogue or conversation are small groups. Um, it also matters who's in the group. So we think about circles of trust as a start to play, uh, a place to start. And the role of the facilitator who is not to participate, but to actually create that space for the others. So those are all elements, not new ideas, not new technology, kind of ancient social technologies that uh, create part one. And then part two is to create a network. And to do that, if it is an IRL conversation, um, there is a uh, process of consented recording of that conversation, and then the ability to uh, lift out highlights, excerpts from that conversation, and allow them to be heard by other small groups. Or, and this is where AI comes in, uh, AI-assisted um, sense-making um, uh, capabilities. So when you have many conversations happening, especially if they share similar conversation prompts. Here are the themes that jump out. Find the I themes, contextualize the themes, um, and with consent make them available back to the people who are involved and the larger community. So which is fascinating. It sounds like it starts with Dana's observation about Crisis Text Line, which is that there's an irreducibly human part that is the end and not the means. A small group conversation where you're getting to know somebody. And then part two is kind of Gordon's analytic piece coming in, possibly facilitated by AI, saying this is what others like you have been saying and where it is similar or different. An interesting use of kind of this sortition of a jury, but then trying to bring it back to a collective. Right. Uh, and one important uh, consequence of the approach is 
there are roles to be played by people. Of course, you can participate in a conversation, you can facilitate, you can be a sense maker, and you can organize dialogue projects beginning to end. So there's a kind of engagement ladder which we're introducing to the MIT community. Harnessing the power of Amway <laughs> to say you two can level up and uh, set the I, goals. I will credit uh, Marshall Gantz and his idea of creating, in designing what you're calling interventions or designing systems where through the use of technology can we create opportunities for leadership, community yeah. leadership, to lead yeah. in different ways. And I, I, I really resonate with uh, uh, your comments about um, by creating that opportunity, um, that's part of the value of this approach. It's not just that we can now have healthier conversations, um, but there are people who get credit, that play a role, that yeah. have that can build a certain kind of relationship with it others. It does sound like a real response to the long run of the era of the half-baked application like Twitter, where Twitter isn't telling you what to use it for or whom to connect with, and it doesn't have a beginning, a middle, and end. It's just sort of a stream you get into. And virality maybe is one of the things that becomes the goal or the thing to avoid, depending on what the virality is about. And this is much more like, here's a thing you'll do, and it avoids the problem I feel like I've seen a lot, which is people will come to a generic platform with so many different goals in mind and then interact. The analogy I keep having in mind is if at the opening of the Super Bowl, everybody like paid a lot for their tickets, they're there, they're just about to have kickoff and the NFL commissioner comes out to the 50 yard line is like, great news everybody, the teams have resolved their differences. <laughs> After a marathon negotiation, they have figured out how to determine which is the better team without the need for a physical contest, possibly dangerous of skill. That would not be a celebratory moment because people are not there to answer the analytic question of which team is better. They're there for the fight. And so if somebody's there to learn and somebody's there to make a friend and somebody's there to troll, that's, and this is saying, well, here's what you're here for. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And um, actually just to take, two different social networks we've now mentioned today, Twitter and LinkedIn, which often people don't even think about because it's not really social media first, but it is a social network that has scaled. Um, and you trace back to the origin uh, and the kind of creation of each of those. And they couldn't be a better contrast in case studies of, in the case of LinkedIn, a very clear idea of what it was for mm. from day one. And Twitter, literally no idea and if you talk to the founders, the, the argument continues to this day of what was the purpose of Twitter. Right. Like, there was, it was unknown. And, Jury's still out. <laughs> and, and, and when I was at Twitter, I was in countless conversations and debates and prototyping with how do we measure the health of conversations on yeah. Twitter. And yeah. the reason I think that's just an ill-defined question is we didn't know what it was for. Right. When we're trying to define Which something. was its virtue for the purpose of growth. Oh, I mean, but it, yes. great for growth. Yeah. Gordon, it sounds like you were wanting to get in. Nope. <laughs> Doesn't sound that way at all. That's the one thing I was going to say. The one person who does not have a view on what you Mis said is Gordon. Misinformation. Yes. Well, Dana. I'll, I'll add something. I'll add something about the early days of LinkedIn that I thought were always very interesting. So I don't know if people remember, but LinkedIn started with no photographs. Uh, and that was actually a very intentional design decision because what people don't remember are all of the dead social network sites that also occurred at that time. And there was another business social network site that had grown first and it intended to be a business social network site and it devolved into a creepy dating site. And I mean creepy in like, like older white men seeking young Asian women, really gross, creepy data site, right? And they couldn't figure out how to resolve that. But one of the things what is- What was this site called? Not well, asking for a friend. Rise. It's, it's, Rise. it's dead. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, I mean, they didn't design for that. They designed it in general things. And the thing about the LinkedIn team is they were like, okay, how do we really narrow and slow growth? And in those early days, it was an intentional slow growth. And I point this out because one of the other things that happened with a lot of these elements is that like, and we learned this from all sorts of online communities over the years, 
it's not just designing for a purpose, but it's nurturing and norm setting and helping support the growth of it. And it was one of the reasons by the time that Twitter launched, um, no matter what they would have designed for, it would have scaled so fast that they wouldn't have had control over it. Um, and this is the interesting question that's often comes up in a lot of new des design decisions, which is how do you do it? How do you purposefully go slowly so that you can build norms? And frankly, companies have really not figured out how to do that whilst and, and get to a sustained growth. Um, you know, they've tried, there's, you know, obviously different attempts like having invite only as one of the most notorious ones. There's different ways, but it's something very interesting to think about when you're thinking about the design of these systems, because those early norms also really determine a bunch of things longer term, which means if your early norm setting are not particularly diverse by any axis you want to choose, that becomes a challenge longer term. Were you, were you a fan of Clubhouse? No. You saw, were you, you, people remember Clubhouse? I guess it still exists. Uh, I mean, it's, it, I think Twitter Spaces kind of, ah, uh, kind of just cloned it and stuck has a. Right I, yeah. If I could just say, I, I, this, this point um, I, I totally agree with, and continuing to use LinkedIn as a positive example, it's also interesting because I, I think in the description for this panel, you know, is it. Uh, through the design of the technology, or is it through human behavior? You know, how do you find healthier so solutions? All different, different ideas of what the title of the paper, panel was. We personalize so the title for each of you. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's uh, so interesting. In the early days of LinkedIn, they found that having uh, a count of how many uh, LinkedIn connects you had turned into like the point of trying to see how many people you could create links with, and so they just capped it and 500 said 500 plus. plus. So that was an example of a, a, a feature tweak that had downstream effects on behavior. On the other hand, in, in terms of going, going slow and setting norms, um, LinkedIn was late to introducing a newsfeed. It has one now. Uh, for me, it operates like Twitter used to, actually. Um, and I don't know if you, for those of you who have been on LinkedIn for long enough, remember when the newsfeed was first introduced for about a year and a half, uh, most of us weren't allowed to post. You could only consume. And the LinkedIn team built relationships with a few hundred influencers who uh, they worked with to model behavior. So Ariana Huffington was on there. Bill Gates was on there, but I wasn't. Um, and we watched, and we learned how the news feed was meant to be used, and then they, um, they opened it up to the rest of us. And a lot of the, the the problems of creepiness and trolling, and I mean, there's a little bit of that, but mostly it got set into motion, uh, into motion with this kind of model behavior, which of course also aligned with the original intent. So this kind of intentionality um, from the beginning of like, why are you doing this? Uh, why are you in this space? Um, does a lot of work, but then so does both tweaking the features and uh, modeling the behavior. I feel like once burned, twice shy, but Gordon, it sure I, looks like I you actually have something to say this time. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> I think that's just my face looks like I have something to say all the time. Um, so this, this relates to this issue. So what you guys are kind of discussing is a kind of an analytic or almost like deliberative, like a way you're approaching a social media platform, which is very important. Uh, some of my work relates to the more kind of automatic modes that we have when we're on social media. And some of this has to do with like, for example, design, simple design elements of like how much stuff is going on and how distracting is it. Uh, Zivi's here. He knows all about this. You can read his dissertation if you want to know about it. Um, but so we found, for example, in the context of misinformation, people will share falsehoods that they would be able to recognize as being false uh, because they're not thinking about whether it's true or false. They're thinking about, are people going to like this? Is this important? Does it make me look good? All that kind of stuff. And so... The way that intersects with our psychology is really important, and you have to think about those things when you're designing all these. One other question on this front. Um, lurking a little bit in the conversation so far, understandably, is the line between the public and the private. And by that, I don't mean official government and private activity. I mean stuff that you're broadcasting to truly undifferentiated strangers and stuff that is in discourse or dialogue with a somewhat smaller group, whether by invitation or by other line that's drawn, MIT, not MIT. And for those media that are nominally or really private, 
I'm curious, getting back to Bellick's introduction and in talking about the surveillance that the platform may feel it has to do in order to promote and police, how to think about having the uh, papa or mama, et cetera, bear overlooking the whole conversation. I mean, I know Facebook considers that its terms of service apply even in private messaging or groups. And now, thanks to AI, they can truly do that. And I'm just curious what that does to humans for which there's just always somebody keeping an eye on things. Does that lead to safer conversations? Does it lead to Soviet-style conversations? I can, I can give you a guess. My guess is that people don't think about that at all. So it's the best of both worlds. Yeah, no idea. I mean, or like, and I mean, a lot of people have no idea that there's even an algorithm on social, like on Facebook and so on. So that's that's a big concern. But I, apart from that, I'm not sure. Uh -huh. And I interviewed teenagers about this years ago, and they were like, "I don't care about a big corporation. I care about my mom, right? Like, I care about the people who have some immediate influence, and I don't want my mom looking in, right? Rather than that. And I don't think that's changed. I think Gordon's entirely right." People aren't looking at that. But I think there's another that reminds part. reminds me like Facebook circles. Broadcast this to everybody in the world except my mom. But yeah. I think there's another component to your question. The majority of people walk around and talk about private things in public all the time. We go to a restaurant, and even though we're kind of like, oh, I hear that, generally we think of ourselves as being able to be private in public in a comfortable enough way. The more status, power, visibility you have, the less you can do that, right? So like, you know, there are people that we can talk about them as influencers or celebrities or anything else where they cannot possibly do that in public where everybody's gonna be like, I'm gonna listen in. And what we've also done to, to Deb's point on media is that media is actually encouraging the parasociality, the like idea that I will be able to like know everything going on about some celebrity's world and life. And we've also had a whole you know, ecosystem that's put a lot of money into building up new waves of celebrities, right? We call them influencers or we call them creators, depending on which world you're in right now. And those are people who want to keep broadcasting bigger and bigger and bigger. And they're sitting there uncomfortably alongside people who um, want to have just friends conversations. And what's difficult is that the system is set up so that it amplifies, right? So you post one thing and you try to get it to get traction and you fail miserably. And you post one thing that you think is just for your five friends and you're like, oh, I'm in trouble, right? Those are very different kinds of reactions to these systems. And so I say that like level of publicity, that level of visibility is really also just an unknown and complicated design piece. And the, the difference is, is that like, you know, go back to LinkedIn, so let's, we'll sort of play with them. The norm setting was that like, it's okay if your boss sees this. That became the norm setting a long time ago. So regardless of like how visible you were, whereas the norm setting in the early days of, of Twitter, of Facebook, whatnot, which is like, these are your friends. These are your friends at Harvard. These are your doormates. Like, have fun. And you're, then you're like, wait, what? Every future self? No. So this is, you know, one of the things that I think we have to grapple with because it's not just about the surveillance of the corporation, but it's also about the fact that we surveil each other all the time. You know, and it's one of the reasons I, I notice everybody here is wearing clothes, right? <laughs> like, I, I kind of appreciate you for this. But, you know... I would assume there's other contexts in which you don't, um, but I'm not going to get a visibility into it. The power of norms. Power of norms, right? But this is one of those things where as we appreciate those components, we have to realize all of the ways in which that gets set in motion across these environments. And this goes back to trolling, where it's like, when the norm is to like scam and spam and screw with each other, see advertising, like, why not? Right? And that's- like, It's the Super Bowl. It's, it's, yeah, and it's just like messing with each other. Yeah. And the layers of scale and grossness, like they don't sit comfortably together. Deb. Yeah, I was just gonna add um, that thinking about this from a, a design perspective, if you're, uh, some of your, I think thinking about building uh, alternate and better futures, um, there's a, a wonderful source book uh, called A Pattern Language, Christopher mm. Alexander and a group of architects, 
um, uh, did this extraordinary study and published a series of design patterns that uh, reoccur across um, different architectural scales in the physical built environment. And the question they asked was, what are, what are patterns uh, that tend to correlate with uh, human flourishing? And of course, they, they have their definition of what they mean by that. And, and the book is literally a series of patterns which are um, diagrammed and described, and some of the um, uh, results if you don't follow the design pattern. So one that's relevant here in thinking about the private-public kind of interface is called the intimacy gradient. And um, the observation is that um, across many different architectural styles, so if you just think about this building, um, there was some um, uh, gate to enter the building, and you were then in a lobby. There was perhaps another to get up the elevator, and you walk through a number of thresholds um, and those thresholds connect spaces, and they, there tends to be a gradient of the, uh, the, the expected intimacy from, you know, if you're coming from the exterior, from the public to the most private. Same goes in, your, you know, in the construction of a home where you might have the front gate and the yard and the deck, um, uh, the, the uh, greeting, the kind of space for visitors, the kitchen, and ultimately the bedroom. And um, you know, one way to think of what we've done with a lot of the design of social media, you know, imagine your child in their bedroom and they open the door and they just step into Times Square. I mean, there is no gradient. So a kind of wish, I, I think a sort of ideal principle for designing um, communication spaces is to bring the intimacy gradient, mm. which works. And then this kind of question of surveillance um, we have real world norms for that as well, which is I don't expect the police in my bedroom unless certain things are reported or certain things happen. And then uh, there's also a, some kind of notification and some kind of justification for piercing yes. uh, from one level. And the norms of how you behave, what you're willing to say, whether you wear clothes or not, who else you expect to be present, who is allowed to pass through the thresholds, there's a pretty elaborate system that we all understand and we find natural and it works. And so how do we bring that kind of thinking and those principles into the spaces that we all together can create. Which That's brings it right back to context collapse and the fact that what is both liberating in the early days, as you were describing, Dana, of an internet that brought people together as fellow travelers who otherwise could never meet and felt like strangers in their own environment, instead now is Times Square is interleaved with the bedroom and we don't know what's, which is why you were saying, wouldn't it be nice if kids spent more time privately out in the public park rather than publicly in their bedroom, which would not have made sense before we had this panel. Um, so I think we should open it up to questions, thoughts, comments from uh, the crew here, with apologies to those online. Uh, both things you might want to uh, have the folks up here speak to, and understanding we have an applied social media lab, which really is about uh, interventions, including engineering ones, uh, uh, led by Professor Mickens and uh, Bellick and the other folks who, who raised their hands. So if you have thoughts on the interventional front, we're all ears for them. So I'll let Tony route the mic to whoever has a hand up and feel free understanding that the sanctum here as defined by a pattern language has a stream out to Times Square. Feel free to introduce yourself uh, advisedly and uh, ask your question. Understood, thank you. Uh, shout out to all my fellow D&D players in the room. Um, my name is Daniel Keating Jr. I am one of the inaugural Emerging Tech Fellows for the city of Boston. So thinking a lot about how can you use emerging technologies to enhance like a distributed democracy model. Um, so people who don't get to uh, City Hall uh, at 12 p.m. on a Wednesday uh, can still participate. Um, so how do you guys think about um, maybe building some sort of like play oriented experience or something in urban green spaces that would allow people to sort of like vote quadratically or assemble some sort of opinion uh, th aggregate through individual interactions uh, in the built environment. And is the baseline to beat here the classic city council meeting where people turn up and they get three minutes at the mic and at 301 it's like, and on to the next? Yeah, I'm thinking okay. like, uh, have you guys ever thought about how you might integrate uh, large language models, artificial intelligence, emerging technologies more broadly into 
um, play as a means of engaging in democratic processes. Okay. Thanks. I'll say, I think it's, for me, when I think about the design of those kinds of things, I start about like breaking it down as to what the layers are rather than putting the technology first. And where does the technology supplement? And I say that because if somebody cannot physically show up and you just stream, I mean, like, hello to all the future viewers, right? They're not going to interact with anybody in this room. They're not going to build those relationships in any way. So is the goal, if you're trying, you started out with like, how do you build a relationship to City Hall? Well, okay. What does that mean? Is that that's a proxy for something? It's just like, do you don't want people to consume your content? So like, how do you break it down? What does it mean to build relationships on your block and think about your values on your block? So how does the block get together? And what are the ways in which they can do that synchronously and asynchronously? Because when you get asynchronously, you can have community and conversation. But often the best way is to do it, mixing it, building it up. And it's like building it up over time. So start with your block. And then you know there's a way of expanding it out where blocks are part of other blocks, rather than throwing you all into next door, right? Because you're like, oh my gosh, what is this? Right? And so that's where it's like thinking about those layers to, to Deb's point is the inverse. It's like, what are the layers of intimacies that can become the building blocks that then go and build the whole system? Right. And that's why I'd say, like, start with those, like, what does it take to do the local thing? What are the activities that will get the block together to build it up to have a conversation with City Hall? So rather than voting, you're actually starting to build representation. I, I would suggest that uh, City Hall invite members of the Boston community to form a dialogue network. Yeah. And then uh, Boston can become a city that listens. And if you're interested in that, this I can, is like I a dialogue network TM, like your dialogue network. We can talk later. I'll uh, yeah. yeah. But you've you've got some affordances to offer. We do. We do yeah. indeed. Very good. Okay. All the thing I'll say is not next door. Not next door. <laughs> that is a negative example in your yeah. view. Got it. Um, all right. Lots of hands up. Uh, Tony, where are you? Where's the mic? I I mic? Oh, the mic has been handed off. Hi, AJ, professor at Northwestern. Thank you for this. It's all very resonant. Um, this question is for everybody, but maybe particularly for you, Dr. Boyd. I was really, I really love how you're taking these offline contexts and showing how they really shape the online. And I'm curious if you've thought, like, what are the big offline regulatory policy structural changes that you think would make a real difference? in this conversation. I'm thinking about like this, how do you incentivize a slow growth platform, right? Like, have you thought about the changes to our financial system or is it breaking up the big companies? Or I'm, I, I'm curious if you think there's like a silver bullet out there that we're Given not. you tweet length root access to the United States code, what do you do? <laughs> I think a lot of it for me is, is we've gotten to a point where VC is the only way to actually Find, find, uh, finance anything. That's not healthy. That is a expectation of this kind of a curve that just brings out the worst. And so I think that we need to, I do think we need to rethink the finance system, absolutely. I also think that there's a lot to be acknowledged of like, you know, alternative plans to building, some of which involve the, the technologies that are out there. Like I love watching community-based organizations. Like, I mean, this is the thing about my work with teenagers they were using it any way they could, whatever tools were available. And so I'm also really excited by the community-based organizations that are like, I know how to bring community, and we are gonna do this, and we're gonna pull on tools here and piecemeal here and see what fits, and sometimes you know, hack it together themselves. So I'm excited by those moments because it doesn't, we don't need everything to be a global scale solution to everything. And so are you, are you taking you... a pass on a regulatory intervention? Oh, and the <laughs> regulatory piece... I mean, people here know better about how to regulate our financial structures. I mean, I, I, hi. Um, I, I, Let the record reflect that Dana looked at <laughs> Professor Lessig. With, 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 <laughs> with love, admiration, and knowing the pain uh, that somebody has gone through um, in trying to navigate these things because you know, it is a f it is financialized. Like these, this is modern day banking at this point. It's just that instead of using property as the financial instruments, it's using us. 
And I don't, and like, so my only break to this is like, I don't want to tweak and tweak and tweak any of these technologies because no matter what, they're still on this growth, 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 which is how we're in a world of AI where the myth and the explosion, the fantasy of AI is so far beyond the technology because we're all buying in on a speculation game so that we can keep the stock price going in light of an election. Like, this is madness. I thought that was blockchain. <laughs> well, we tried blockchain, okay, metaverse. Okay. Those didn't work, right. but apparently we all bought into AI. Okay, so um, I feel like that was a tag a friend. So, um, I, I, Lessig, you've got an uh, intervention <laughs> oh, if you want. No. Do you, you want a regulatory You solution? don't want to be a root striker? You don't want to have the root access to, no. All right, let the record reflect that Lessig is deferring all thoughts to his own session later in the day. <laughs> so. Uh, somebody else must have the mic. Where is it? And uh, it looks like, is it, is the mic somewhere? Right Who has there. the mic? You're good. It, oh. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Casey. I'm an affiliate uh, with the Berkman Klein Center. And uh, my question is for you, uh, Dr. Pennycook. Um, I'm fascinated by like that research and those results. It's super, super interesting. Um, I do a lot of grassroots climate advocacy um, at, for, uh, for climate change. And as part of that, we rely pretty heavily on research that um, seems to show that facts are actually not like a great way to convince people that climate change is a problem. Um, obviously, we know doom and gloom is not as well. Um, and we rely pretty heavily on kind of like meeting people where they at, where they are already at, um, which obviously seems to contradict with what you're doing. And I'm just curious what your thoughts are, if it's due to the AI or due to kind of maybe like a professionalized effect of the platform. Um, but why you might think that that is? Well, the, the first thing is it depends on uh, what the facts are supposed to matter for. Now, the facts matter here because it's specifically about what people believe to be true. And so it's just directly related to that. The problem with climate is a lot of the concerns are not necessarily, I mean, in some cases it's whether it's happening and whether we're, we're the cause of it, but it has to do with changing your behaviors and uh, uh, endorsing policies. That's a lot diff more difficult. It's not just about facts. It's it's there's it's about much bigger things that we've, um, which so, is also very interesting. Yeah. It's showing that at least the initial confines of your experiment were akin to the way a librarian is trying to help a patron, which is to help them in their pursuit of truth, and hopefully they're open to that. Whereas an advocacy org might be saying, "I'm trying to help the planet, and getting you to see my point of view is the way to help the planet, and probably help you too." Right. But you're saying those are very different tasks. They can be different. I mean, that is, you, this would be more, the past research on the facts and the climate change is, is going to be worse uh, inherently than what we're trying to do, which is not a flex. It's because if you're trying to debunk people's false beliefs, you have to guess what they believe. In this case, we don't have to guess. They say what they believe, and you can debunk the specific things but that you they But there's another kind of, I don't mean this in a negative sense, parlor trick perhaps lurking in your experiment, which is you nicely elided how to determine what the ground truth is by basically letting people identify with something weird they believe, and weird as in not in the norm, and then you left the model to try to say whatever it's going to say, but somebody trained and tuned the model. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I don't know, which model did you use? This was uh, ChatGPT for Turbo when that experiment. We've used other ones, you get similar yeah. things. It's just trained on the... But it does make you wonder that all of the questions of content moderation and shaping that could go into a model that's fine-tuned mm -hmm. for X or Y or for what happened in Tiananmen Square, is it going to give the same answer to a user in Beijing than it does in Boston? Yeah, I mean, that's a better question for someone who's an expert in AI, which is not me. <laughs> but I, I think it's interesting. I mean, it's, it is a really exciting result. And just thinking about the context um, and what elements of the context could transfer into the work you're doing. So for example, um, if I don't trust the messenger, if I believe their motives or their values are not aligned with mine, um, a, a wall may go up. And I think it sounds like you brought that wall down through a combination of, I mean, it's, you know, you're using a, a, a platform to recruit subjects, you're getting, you're probably paying them, you probably, telling them it's an AI. So very different than uh, this is someone I don't trust who is actually doesn't care about jobs in my um, uh, locale and they're just worried about 
what's going to be better for the people in the city, and they're telling me these facts um, for the wrong reasons. And and so just it's just interesting to have this as a capability, and then to think about how do you create context where someone um, will feel like they can open up and share what they believe and have that conversation with someone or something. So just they take trust. one more step. I mean, it's pretty what's cool. the what's the service or product you would design for her? <laughs> oh, that's a th another question for somebody else who's not me, also. But I mean, I think in this case, that's I think funny. I was asking Deb. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay. Oh, of okay. Too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, do you have a product for that? I could take a shot, but <laughs> you go first. No, I was just I was just going to summarize quickly a, a brief point, which is that it indicates that the facts do matter. It's just that it's not the only thing that matters, and there's especially when it comes to more complicated downstream things like policy. More things are going to matter, so you have to. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think that the worry that many of us have that those other people are being brainwashed by things that are not true, um, it's actually a, um, a widely held concern that we have about one another. And so, and, and yet, n I think very few people actually behind private, you know, in private would say, yeah, I don't mind being duped. I don't mind, you know, a, a, a bullshit or kind of tricking me. Um, no one wants that, right? So I want my kid to be healthy. It would be good to know that my beliefs about vaccines are true. That's right. And so can you create a context where someone is willing to let their shields down and share what they believe? And then whether it's a machine, a person plus a machine, but I mean, I think the scalability of something like this to have that private conversation and come out feeling a little less confident about one thing or more confident about another um, and not have to lose face for, for how you came to that conclusion. So in your, I don't know the details of your work, but that would be, it's not, a, it's not so much the product, but thinking about how you even approach um, someone or someone else maybe approaches them where they're willing to let their shield, you know, shields down. And then there is a very cool kind of capability that your, your work demonstrates could scale. And we're also testing it, so you should email me when we're not it's oh. not not ready yet but we're testing it no. that that's super interesting it's almost like the the um you're removing the social pressure of that judgment and i sorry just one other thing it makes me think of that is really interesting is we have an instance here where the ai is more trustworthy than a human even though normally it's the reverse but we find this because um we're so afraid of of that potential social pressure and social judgment so thank you that's very right. much yep. that was really interesting uh, I want to say that there are other places where you people... You get the mic to the next place yeah, while Dana waits in. There are other places where the AI is more trustworthy. And I, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. And I think that it's about realizing that, like, yeah, it's a safekeeper. It's the same reason why sometimes strangers are more trustworthy, right? Because it's just like, you're not going to judge me. That's huge. Just your, your surveillance point that it's... I mean, we find this in our work at MIT, that the most risk in opening up and being vulnerable is you'll share something that will have some interaction effect with someone close to you as opposed to someone distant. And but it so, is such yeah. a, I, I won't say mind hack, only by paralipsis, but it's both a tool and that you can interact with it like a research back and forth, and it's presenting as your friend, and it's got all the elements of friendship that make you trust it and that make you let your shields down, and yet... I think that's the old guy talking. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, ha we actually, we've done a version of the experiment where we tell people both, it's trying to persuade you, so it's yeah. not your friend, or try to persuade it, and it still works the same, essentially, in this case. But. Although friends often spend a lot of time yeah, trying exactly. to persuade but each other. I'm your friend, my best friends you shouldn't like, do yeah. X. Yeah, yeah, but my best friends convince me when I'm wrong. Yeah. yeah. But social dynamics really matter within this. Like, I'm thinking about Nosh Contractor's experiment, which is just amazing. He had a condition of an AI as a research assistant, one as a re and then he had a, an undergrad as a research assistant. And their skills were about the same, which is to say, not so great. Um, but when the, the condition with the um, undergrad, everybody sort of felt bad for the undergrad and mentored the undergrad and supported the undergrad, right? And the condition for the AI, they were like, fuck the AI, right? Like, AI is an asshole. Um, but they ended up collectively bonding as a team better in the AI condition over the collective hatred of the system. That's not your friend. There's a lot there. Uh, so to be continued, it does make me wish we'd had another seat for an AI panelist yeah. that would be like... I just sort of putting out a constant slurry of observations that were just like, yes, yes, we hate you, but that bonds us together. 
It's just what fits in the chair can change in an instant. That's the weird thing. It is incorporated by reference from whatever GPT-40 subtext 25 is. And that I think worries me. You might be an AI given the random crazy ideas that come out of your mouth every time we say something. Thank you. <laughs> I've set my high temperature temper very high. High temperature setting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. High temperature, exactly. Running a fever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, well, let's see if a fever breaks. Next thought question. And uh, we're starting to hit the home stretch, so good to keep it quick. Hello, Marshall. So, Marshall Van Alstein. Um, Gord, this is a question for you, because you've used this in a great way, and it's wonderful research, but you've now just shown an incredibly persuasive technology. To te to ads are persuasion technology, and technology has good and bad uses. You know, nuclear power for bombs versus power, you know, planes for travel versus flying into trade centers. What happens when this goes over to the merchants of doubt? What happens when the Internet Task Agency, agency from Russia gets hold of this and tries to use it to convince we released AIDS in Africa to kill people, you know, or Elon Musk wants to use it to persuade us that Harris is a bad candidate. Um, how are we going to put friction on the bad uses as we lubricate the good ones? Uh, so the psychological answer is it's not good. The, I mean, people do not have divine access to the truth. We're giving them persuasive arguments based on real evidence. And the, I mean, people to some extent have some calibration to reality, but this is, there's no way. But you're giving them good arguments because out of your wheelhouse, yeah, yeah. you're trusting the people building the AI yeah. built it well. But it has good evidence. I mean, it, but then if you feed it with misinformation or you get it to, yeah, it, people will be convinced by it. It's people don't, people, we, we, the, the key kind of psychological uh, thing to take away from all this is that we are responsive to our, the, the environment. Evidence is the things that we experience, what we see. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. That could lead someone down a rabbit hole. You can use it to get them out of it, but you can also use it to get them in it. And so there's no inherent... It's, it the only hope there is your original report of the asymmetry of taking people who do believe, I don't know, something mainstream right. but we didn't are train, less likely to we be We didn't persuaded. train a model to be really good at do, doing that. So one yeah. could yeah. do that. It's a good question for delivery later. Combine this with Citizens United and spend infinite resources just to be Another thing for, for you to talk record, about. He wants to combine it with Citizens United and beg Larry to figure out how to solve that problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, where has the mic landed? Hi, my name is Rachel Kalmar. I'm an affiliate at Berkman. I have a question around online communities and curating a civilized discourse and whether there's a role for perhaps AI or not in moderating. And some additional context, I've been in a few communities over the past few years where the forum for conversation has collapsed to such a point where that forum has had to shut down because people with irreconcilable beliefs have had uh, conversations that have led to people being attacked and the, those forums are no longer available. Is there, wh wh what do you think is a way to address this? Is there a maximum number of people? Are there technological solutions to this? What are, what are some of the ways that we can promote better online discourse and have more civilized communities? I will just want to say one thing quickly, which is there's no way to avoid that entirely. Uh, but I have no other insights, so <laughs> hopefully Dana does. Sometimes dumpsters just catch on fire. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that the, the answer is, you know, it, is it depends, right? Like, humans are complicated. They're messy. Navigating humans to be able to be civil is not like a one-size-fits-all. But one of the things I can tell you is that, like, just dropping a bot into it is, like, a disaster. Is anybody here, since we've got some old geezers in the room, for which I love y'all, does anybody remember Lambda Moo? Who remembers Lambda Moo? Like that was, oh, see, I loves you. That's my people. Um, so the thing that was really interesting is Lambda Moo had a moment where um, a, a, a bot was dropped into it. Um, and, the, and everybody was really excited because the idea was that the bot was going to help people understand the social dynamics of the, the space. You, and this was going to go. You say what a Moo is. Oh. I'm just going to tell an online community. Um, we're just going to leave it at that and not go into deeper. That's a whole other 
Um, but the reason why is they dropped a bot into this environment where people were talking and people originally would ask it, be like, you know, oh, like, who do I talk to the most? Oh, I talk to Jonathan the most. That's awesome. Who does Jonathan talk to the most? Laura, what? That is so not cool. I'm never speaking to you again, right? And it was interesting how it broke things by trying to provide information about the space. And I use this as an example, as a particular experiment, because it's this reminder that like these, these technologies have to become meaningful parts of the social environment with all sorts of expectations and rules. They have to be socialized into the environments for them to make sense. And that's the thing, you know, like, that's also to Nash's point from his previous study. So I think the thing to think about in terms of online communities is like that is a social process. And technologies can aid and abet social processes and the technologies can disrupt social processes. But there has to be some folks thinking holistically about the social processes. And repair work is really hard. No matter once there is a rupture, trying to do that repair work, it takes time, it takes work, and it might not happen. Yeah. I th I think if the question was um, you know, in terms of online communities and moderation, I, I see AI, the, the kind of modern large language models is having huge potential. And then there's just a question of to what degree can you centralize or do you want to decentralize the norms? And to what degree do you, is it uh, an augmentative uh, technology versus something you put into, um, into automatic mode? So there's just a, a, a huge design space that's opened up. And if you're trying to moderate uh, toxic conversations that keep breaking out on Xbox where you've got hundreds of millions of uh, users and the, the primary pur purpose is to create a gaming environment, and then you deploy the totally automated bots and people know it. Um, that's what Microsoft is, has done, as far as I understand. Um, in other contexts, actually part of the point of it might be to learn how to um, uh, hold space, the, some of the work I was talking about earlier in our own uh, example. And there, the AI could play a very different kind of role in helping you learn how to be better, but never uh, hand over the reins to the, the automatic bot. But So there's a kind of spectrum. Um, but this idea of an automatic technology that we trust to moderate our behavior. I mean, we've got traffic lights. Um, so there's various contexts where it makes perfect sense and others where we, we don't want to give up uh, the, um, the agency or control. So I think like many of the questions here, it, it depends, right? Okay. Depends on your context. Gordon, did you have a thought on that? I, I was I, just going to say latent in Rachel's question is the idea that maybe things have gotten worse over time, that there are ruptures that might not have been as common given the same circumstance and people, mm. and kind of asking what's with that, mm. and is there a way, again, what is the baseline, to lessen that if that is good, for which I, I hear some speculation, maybe I'm high temperature on your comments, Dana, but um, the ways in which a bot, forget about whether it's smarter or not than the humans, but tends to have a lot of material it can graze upon and everything is sort of recorded not for evil surveillance purposes, but to give it fodder to chew on, means that if you have a dispute, you can't just walk away with your respective memories of it, which are already starting to haze and we can agree to disagree on who started it, when you can always just go back and roll the tape or ask the bot or something, which means that any rupture becomes a permanently fixed in a tangible medium rupture that everybody can come and gawk at like something hanging in a museum. And I don't know if that suggests a technical fix, something I know you've studied a lot about the value of intentional ephemerality and impermanence in the environment rather than having everything kind of on a permanent record. I think, yes, I think that's really valuable in a lot of specific, con a lot of contexts. I also think that there are places where folks think that they've got shared norms and shared values and shared views until a situation happens. And it's those moments, like, you know, I mean, let's let's be clear. I mean, we're at Harvard. I mean, Israel, Palestine. Like, you think that you are sharing the same perspective and then there's an issue that happens and it's a rupture. Managing that rupture is really hard. 
because people think there's one right answer or they, they're, they're so in pain or they're so navigating those other things. Those are those moments where our environment of speed, of 24 seven, of you know, like scale doesn't work well. And so sometimes you just have to dial it back, right? And that's an interesting moment to sit there being like, okay, we can't have this conversation at campus scale. Can we have this conversation at six person scale? Can we have these conversations in these like hard things where we can feel and hear each other through pain, through discomfort, through different views, through different data, right? Where there's not an easy truth. And that's like, you know, I, I don't know if that's what you're referencing, but there's so many communities that have like fallen to shit over the last year over this because they thought they had reached stability until they didn't. And stability, those moments are when you realize certain, certain configurations just don't work and you have to find a different way. And I have to say some of the places that I've been really enjoying, turn off the keys at night. They're like, we cannot discuss this at midnight. Nobody is in a good place to have a conversation about this at midnight. It is, that WhatsApp group is off, admin only. Come back on, come yeah. back on in the morning when we're a little bit breathing. Think about this overnight. So these are other things where you can actually use some of those design features. I want to point out WhatsApp's uh, like admin only mode is like an interesting one of this. And, and one, of, uh, one of our folks at ASML was recalling a past uh, social media platform that modified, mod uh, modulated its comments. A form of punishment was to take away somebody's vowels. So it's just <laughs> the consonants. So the message is still there, but it kind of is going to be a little goofy. And it's like, so maybe at night, just the vowels stop working or something. You can still get your message out. Um, and certainly in the early days, removing caps lock would have been incredibly helpful in stopping people from <laughs> screaming at each other. And it's also a reminder of both the awkwardness of implicitly or explicitly taking on the mantle of being a social engineer. That is an epithet. That is not a like, oh, well, you must be a good engineer if you're a social engineer. While realizing that so much of our environment now is constructed, looks like it's just natural. It's the duck serenely going across the pond when underneath all the feet are madly going according to some considered algorithm by somebody. And, figuring out how to navigate that hall of mirrors and how to understand that our society is engineering itself. And it's almost like the question of, well, we're not gonna be self-created, but how could we be mindfully self-revising? That and feels like the way to go. That there yeah. are hosts in those conversations. We might call them moderators or admins or any number of things, but there are people that nurture things. and you know. How many of you have read Priya Parker's The Art of Gathering? Anybody here? This is a really interesting book. It has nothing to do with technology. It has to do with how to be thoughtful about gathering people together. And it's one of those things I really recommend for those who think about technology to step back and be like, what does it mean to be a good host? And I think a core answer to that is to remove one's own direct preferences and interests and separate those from one's perceived interests of the group and its members and its thriving. And that that requires a form of sacrifice that you have to operate at a different level other than just saying what you think should happen. The way in the like ideal a speaker of the house is she, trying she to just help the- She would argue it very much depends. Yeah. And she would argue that like it's about intentional design of the situation yeah. rather than there is one design fits all. Yeah. But I, I do think that there are a lot of dialogue practices where what you just said is exactly right. That someone needs to hold space. You're literally part of the space is created by a person who if they try to also then enter that space themselves, they can no longer hold it. Mm -hmm. And so what you're saying mm -hmm. shows up in a lot of different, uh, a lot of different dialogue practices and traditions. Kind of the way maybe the function of the AI and Gordon's experiment is not to have a dog in the fight. I'm just here to help you get to where you're going, which is understand whether X is true or not. So uh, we're at our time. I I'm disappointed we have not solved every problem uh -huh. of the digital dumpster fire, but. Um, but we have round two. We have round two coming up. It. Larry's going to solve it in the next uh, session. Thank you all for this temporary community in this room and the uh, more enduring ones that will follow. <laughs>